there's no format to this. That's the first thing I want to say. This, this idea came from Sue. There was a conversation going on on Facebook and Sue got in touch and says, we need to do this. It's 25 years since that championship was won. I jumped on the idea, absolutely loved the idea. And I said, we'd work together to make it happen. And this has all come together in about 48 hours, which is quite astonishing. Absolutely astonishing. So uh, one more coming in. Here he is, Big Sky. <laughs> <laughs> so we should have organised champagne around the place, right? <laughs> we thought you'd have it. We thought you'd send it to yeah. us. I know. I was too slack. <laughs> Terrible. Clive Allen. How are you doing, guys? You're all good. <laughs> yeah, and you put the shirt on, too. Who's representing? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh, easy, big guy. I tried to find my jersey. <laughs> uh, Have you washed it? No fix. That's A B. It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, should we make a start? Please. Uh, it's five <clears throat> minutes past. We think this is going to last about an hour, but if people have got to go, we'll understand that. And uh, if you stay till the end, we'll close it down at some point. That's not Tony Dorsey. Something like that. That's the legend that is Tony Dorsey. <laughs> well, we've got everybody we wanted. <laughs> Can I say what a pleasure it is to be here to do this? Because it's absolutely wonderful. Never when Sue and I spoke about this did we think we could pull this off in that amount of time. So, Sue, first of all, I want you to say a few words about your thinking when, when you set this up. Well, I just thought it was a real big shame that we weren't able to all meet together somewhere to celebrate. I mean, it was an almighty achievement for Birmingham to actually win the championship that year. And it really shouldn't be forgotten. And it couldn't be just a Facebook thing. We had to do something special because it was special. Obviously, we've lost some people along the way. And I'd like to take a moment to say we miss you, we love you, and the family who's remaining. So first of all, we've got this guy who's in my background at the moment, Pete Bamford, who is no longer with us. And uh, Sue said that she'd like to mention Pete here. Two other people, the first of whom is this guy. Who's that woman with him? <laughs> well, can I say Alan Wilford, he's greatly missed, greatly missed. That came down to the funeral. It was an incredible day and it's so sad that he's no longer with us. But uh, I know that Dell and Richard are with us. Their mic's off at the moment, but I'm sure they'll, uh, they'll speak if they want to. The final person we want to mention here, and I don't know if there's anybody else that we've missed out on, uh, if they there is then please uh let us know the final person we're going to mention is this lady who is mm -hmm. sheila hopkins legend of this parish sheila was just wonderful to me uh, you know we took to each other and we were great friends and i know she was friends with everybody and we lost her how many years ago sue uh what was it 10 11 really 11, oh, my 11. God. Time mm -hmm. is flying by so quickly, it's just ridiculous. So those are the three people we wanted to mention. As I say, if there's anybody that we've missed, then do pop it onto the chat and we'll give him a mention before this thing finishes. I thought the best thing to do would be to get Harry to say a few words and then just throw this thing open. We might get a few words from Nick Nurse. I believe he's been doing some stuff in America, Canada, somewhere. I'm not quite sure. You know, I don't, I don't keep up with this basketball <laughs> thing. So Harry... Harry, I want to find out how you became involved with the bullets. Uh, do you want the real story or the made-up story? <laughs> Whichever one doesn't take us to court. <laughs> okay. The real story is that one of my partners was a uh, entertainment guru and he was over in Las Vegas for a big conference of stadiums. And he just so happened to be partying one night and playing the piano and this lovely lady was sitting on his lap while he was playing the piano and she said, what's going on in Australia? And he went, basketball, because he happened to be a partner in the Kings at the time. He said, it's the best thing ever. We're selling out stadiums. We've got fantastic things happening. 
And she said, well, I'm running a place called the NIA in Birmingham and we would love basketball to come in as an anchor tenant. So Kevin, bless him, came back to Sydney to our next board meeting and went, Birmingham, we've got to go to Birmingham. Everything's happening up there. They want us. At which point we decided that we were going to come to Birmingham. And that's how we got involved. And we got in touch with uh, Bernard, who, of course, had the bullets at the time. And he was willing to take us on as partners. And that's how we got involved. It was all due to the fact that one of my partners was in Las Vegas at the time at a conference. That is absolutely astonishing. <laughs> and what did you make of Birmingham when you arrived here? Well, I, I had been pre-warned. Some of the things <laughs> that I've been pre-warned about weren't good. <laughs> but I have to say what was fantastic when I arrived was the people. <clears throat> And the organisation was so, everybody was so involved and so invested with the Bullets that it made my transition and Sarah's transition much easier into the team and into the organisation because it was just an amazing group of people that I was able to work with. And as you can see by everybody being here. Nick Nurse, how did you become involved? Because you were with Derby, came over as a player for Derby and uh, went on to be player coach. How did you become involved with the Bullets? I was coaching at the University of South Dakota and um, got an idea to take a bunch of ragtag fab college seniors. <laughs> <laughs> college seniors on a tour of england to play and see if they could get some jobs over there of course fab missed the flight had to catch up with us a day later but um i was just over there and just kind of um playing some games around and just kind of saw the you know the the arenas were popping up and the sky was coming in and I was an assistant coach at the time, and I, I actually planned on coming over for a year just to get some head coaching experience, and I enjoyed it so much. He almost had to throw me out a couple times, but <laughs> but, but, uh, but I ended up staying, what, 10, 11 years, I think, something like that, with a bunch of stops in between. That was it. Uh, Dave Adkins, a agent in Australia. He was a big agent in Australia, knew Harry, and I think Dave hooked us up originally, didn't he, Harry? He did, Nick, yes, yep. and uh, yep. you were recommended by Tim. You know, Dave was a really good guy, and you know, I knew him quite well, and he would always give me a call, and you know, he was a talent, and Tony came from Dave as well, Tony Dorsey, so we were very lucky. Oh, right yeah, that's there. right. That's right. Dave Dave was uh, with Tony, too. I, 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 Tony and Harry, I probably talked to Dave um, two or three times a day. Oh, fantastic. Just, still, we, we email, we email constantly. He watches every game. And as you know, he was a former coach down there in Australia. So he's a, that's it, Mike. Not quite as sexy as piano bars in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> you say that, hey, but the I, only problem was no. I wasn't there. I wasn't in Vegas. <laughs> I'm living vicariously as always. <laughs> Nick, there's a there's a Chinese saying that uh, a journey of a million miles starts with the first step. And from that, I take you would never have won a championship in the NBA had you not won one in England. Tell me about that journey. The hundred percent, right? I I was uh, what was I? Twenty six, twenty seven years old, I think. Harry, I don't know what is this. Yeah, about that. 40, no, I think I was 20. 40, 45 minus 25 puts me at 20. I'm yeah. no, just kidding. Let's put the years back a bit. Yeah, yeah. And I was, uh, for sure, I think that was, um, I was just trying to see if I, if I wanted to coach and if I was any good and wanted to pursue it as a profession for real. And um, there was a couple moments there where I was out there at the Brahms Grove Hotel where I was packing my shit up to go home. We were, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we were we were we were six and six or five and six or seven and eight or eight and eight or whatever it was before we finally uh got going and obviously um you know mike we had an incredible group of guys man we had a team that fit just right you know great superstars and great bench and you know just everything around and you guys were great support and that got me believing I could do it that first year, and that that was so enjoyable and so um, so much learning that I was never looked back from that. It was really like year one of my coaching career, really. You know. You say you had a great bunch of guys, but somebody put online when they were talking about the 25th anniversary that we'd been whooped by Sheffield. Now, I don't remember this, so it might be not I right. Don't remember that. I don't know. We'd been whooped by <laughs> Sheffield, and I don't know who took the decision to bring in another player. 
that other player was somebody called Trevor Gordon. Trevor Gordon, the legend. What was it like for you, Trevor, because you were at Manchester at the time? Tell me how you got the call and why you decided to join the team. Manchester, long and short of it, didn't work out. Love the guys, love my teammates, love the fans. We had some disagreements with our management. I looked around the league for some different places to go and I was familiar with the guys. I like the guys. I, uh, I like the attitude of the management and I love the fans because I've already played in Birmingham a lot. Even when they lost, they were like really fun, really uh, good people to hang out with. So for me, it was kind of a no brainer. I wanted to stay up in the north in the Midlands. I got there and the first thing I noticed was I, I felt like I had to change the attitude a little bit. They were hopeful. There's a lot of hope there. And I'm like, well, we, you know, I, I went to a couple of practices. I'm like, this squad is ready. We've got strength and backups in every position. Guard play, forward, center, you know, it was no doubt. The coaching made basketball fun again. It's rare that you go play for a coach, no matter how hard you work, you don't feel like you work hard enough. He was just such a great motivator. It made you want to do more when you play more and everyone played for each other. That's one thing I loved about the team. The fans supported you no, no matter what, but I had to get that whole, I hope we can do it, can we do it? And I guess I didn't realize that you guys are just taking such a, a pounding by Sheffield. So I guess there was a lot of questions to be answered. Okay, great. For me, it was just like, well, hey, you know, Let's just go play this game. We know what we can do. Uh, I'm looking at Mike Payne right now. And I had to tell this guy, dude, if you don't shoot the ball, I can't get a rebound. So even if you miss, I get a rebound. If you make it, you get a bucket. This is this is a no-brainer. Just shoot the ball. Sky, big sky. Hey, Sky, you're going to be open a lot because once I get hot, they're going to double team. I'm going to dump it off to you. Just make the bucket. If you make the three throw, that's a bonus. You know, I don't have to talk to, to Nigel. I don't have to talk to, you know, any of the other guys. Steady. It's exactly that. Steady was always steady, brought the ball down, tough on defense, pressured the ball. It made my job easy, you know, get the rebound, toss it out to Nigel and uh, uh, on the wing, let, let him go. You know, I, half the time I didn't come down the floor. <laughs> you know, like there's some rest. We had so much fun. It almost didn't seem like work. It almost seemed kind of unfair at times. And that's all I remember, just the, the amount of fun, the amount of joy, the amount of camaraderie. I just sent a message to Emiko. I'm not sure if he's on the call. Do you guys remember that night we were sitting around talking and we were talking about who our childhood heroes were and all this? And Amiko told me that it was me. And I'm like, it kind of blew me away. Like, what, what are you talking about? Like, everyone's talking about Dr. J, Michael Jordan, this, that, the third. And what it was is years ago prior, uh, while I was still in London, I ran into Amiko in the gym in, uh, in London. And uh, I didn't think I was that knowledgeable. Apparently I was. And I had encouraged him and some other players to work on this and work on that. Uh, that's why Amico was so strong going to his left, because when we played pickup ball, he always went back to his right. So I never played him to his left. I was waiting for him to come back to the right and the shot. So eventually, I guess he developed his left hand from going, you know, that's from, from the lessons that, that I, I like to think I taught him and a few other players. I never thought I was that great of a teacher, but I could obviously see when something was wrong. And I always spoke out about it or try to be supportive of that. And I also try to take criticisms myself. So the guys, we, we were real open about what we needed to do. You know, who was having a good day, bad day. Don't worry about it. We're going to get this thing done. And uh, I think that faith and the faith in my coach carried forward. You know, so no matter what was going on in the game, we got this. We down by 30? Oh, we got this. I told some of the fans, hey, listen, have you guys booked your, your Wembley tickets yet? And that was like the first half of the year. Like, you know, you better book your Wembley tickets now because, you know, we know we're going to be there. Uh, get, get the cheap tickets now. So, again, that all came from just being around the guys. And just like I said, the, just the general belief. And it, it almost seemed kind of cocky. I, mean, I know Nigel was, the, was probably the most cocky, humblest guy ever. Like, we got this. Like, you know, he, he was saying such a nonchalant type of way. And the guy, he laughed at guys talking. Oh, the guys, listen, guys, they're talking trash. Let's go get him, you know. And it was just, it was just so much fun, you know. I'm looking at Ricky too. Like, hey, Rick, what's good, man? Now let me let me no. let me jump in here, Trevor, because uh, I don't know who we were playing in the first game that you played at, at the NIA. I think it was at the end of the game. I said, tell your friends what's going on down here because this is going to be the championship winning team. I said that out loud over the microphone. 
And Tony Dorsey, on the night we won this championship, did something which nobody ever done for me before. He went to pick up some Budweiser, I think it was. And he picked up two four-packs of Budweiser. And he walked across the floor to the commentary point where I was doing Sky. And he says, that's for you. And sometime later, I said, why did you do that? What? He says, because you were the first person to say that we were going to win a championship.